The distinction between individual and group cultural rights has been controversial for some time. It is often brought up in connection with women's rights and children's rights. The declaration outlines those borders by clearly placing its norms within the overall normative framework of internationally recognized human rights. More specifically, Article 34 of the Declaration states that indigenous peoples have the right to promote, develop, and maintain their institutional structures and their distinctive customs, traditions, procedures, and practices, and in the case where they exist, juridical systems or customs in accordance with internationally recognized human rights standards. In the exercise of the rights and enunciated in the present declaration, human rights and fundamental freedoms of all shall be respected. The provision set forth in this declaration shall be interpreted in accordance with the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance, and good faith. This means that an indigenous people or community must respect the human rights of individuals within it. In addition, a group cannot oblige an individual within it to exercise his or her rights as an indigenous person. In other words, a group cannot impose indigeneity on an individual. This is a matter of choice. The duties that an indigenous political entity would require of its members, its citizens, must comply with international human rights standards. Indigenous leaders who participated for decades in the negotiations of the declaration were well aware of and agreed to this principle early on, namely that the declaration is itself a human rights instrument. International human rights treaty bodies to which indigenous peoples have submitted various cases over the decades have consistently on a case by case basis given the permissible limitations of individual cultural rights when they conflict with imputed rights of the collectivity. According to these treaty bodies, limitations of the individual's cultural rights vis-a-vis -vis the group could be imposed only when the survival and welfare of the group are threatened and only for as long as the situation of threat persists. Many discussions have been and are being held by indigenous women leaders on the importance of culture and cultural rights for them as individuals and as members of indigenous collectivities, especially issues of health related traditional knowledge and customs are stressed by the women, including in the area of birthing practices and maternal care. At the same time, indigenous women have stressed that not all customs or rights, R-I-T-E-S, are positive for women's and children's human rights, and that the negative ones need to be amended. Indigenous women view their issues at the intersection of gender, race, and class, and demonstrate critical leadership to solve problems affecting them, whether they originate outside or within the community, or are a combination of both. The area of violence against women is a particular focus of indigenous women leaders and is systematically addressed by them. This is the case, for example, in the work of the International Indigenous Women's Forum, as well as at the World Conference of Indigenous Women in Lima, Peru in 2014. At the latter conference in Lima, Peru, its declaration has stated the following. We, indigenous women and girls, are subject to all forms of violence, such as domestic violence and sexual abuse, including in the contexts of trafficking, armed conflict, environmental violence, and extractive industries. Moreover, indigenous women have been at the root of an international expert seminar at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues on this matter in 2012 and have articulated their recommendations on the issue of violence during the sessions of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. The Permanent Forum has indeed adopted many recommendations on violence against Indigenous women. The discussion of whether a custom, a right, R-I-T-E, of a non-Indigenous or of an Indigenous culture is violative of human rights is a broad and valid one. 
no culture is static and each culture constantly evolves as individuals and groups shape and reshape it. At the same time, it should be kept in mind that people who belong to dominant cultures and support the state laws and policies that underpin such cultures tend to view their dominant uh, uh, cultures as neutral or normal or good and to belittle or vilify the indigenous or minority cultures that are marginalized by them. Discussing these issues with lucidity, objectivity and responsibility within a human rights context, as indigenous women do, can result in a productive analysis and action points for how better to move forward.